Hello, everyone. Welcome after the lunch break. So the last afternoon of the event. Yeah, we are thankful you came here because we know it was, you know, very appealing with this weather to stay outside and, you know, just keep chilling. But it is what it is. So we have a talk, Declarative Networking in Declarative Work World. Sorry. So I'm Mateusz. This is Ben. We are the OpenShift Bare Metal Networking team. And I'm not native English speaker, but when I say we are the team, this is what I mean. There is no one else apart of us. So yeah, usually you would say we are part of the team, but no, this is, you know, this is the team. Very short intro about us. So I'm based in Switzerland. I've been doing a lot of random stuff before I came to Red Hat. So academia, banking, telco, I've seen a lot of stuff. I know what I don't want to do in my future. And yeah, so, so yeah, this is it. Some buzzwords, so cloud, metal, stuff, network security. I do not do AI. I don't want to do it in the near future. So yeah, this is, this is it. When I'm not touching computers, I'm doing some farming. And this is actually way more interesting, but it doesn't give you money to feed the family. So you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, and I am Ben Nemec. And yes, I know I'm mispronouncing my last name for all of you tech speakers. Um, I live in Minnesota, and I'm currently the team lead for the OpenShift on-prem networking team, which, as Matt mentioned, is not super impressive because we are the entire team. Uh, I previously worked on the OpenStack Oslo and Triple O teams, which were the uh, OpenStack common libraries and deployment tools. And you can see there my email address if you want to get in touch after the presentation. Uh, right, so let's go to the meat of the talk. So yeah, this is very yada yada slide. So in general, why would even people think about multi-networking? Like, you know, we've been living in the Kubernetes world when you just get a pod and you don't care about networking because there is no such a thing in networking. You are just getting some, you know, cloud VM and no one knows what happens there. No one really cares. But, you know, then comes some, then we have you know, some more specialized customers coming and they start doing network equipment, routers, switches. So basically, you know, not your regular web app where you have DB, some front end, and, and this is it. Uh, telco customers, this is very evolving area, and they start moving into, you know, cloud native stuff and so on. So they have very, very different requirements than regular web developer deploying something. And also a use case is separate storage networks. So what, whatever you do, once you start doing a lot of transfer of the data, Having separate networks for purpose A, B, C, and one of them being storage is something that comes very quickly into your, um, into your scenario. And yeah, usually you don't want to have user data flowing over the, same de over the same channel as your control data, storage, and so on. So here comes multi-networking. And let's go back, I would say, 20, 50 years. So what were people doing with network configuration? in the old times. So you're just getting, you know, physical server referral or system of your, of your choice. And we have the famous, infamous network manager with its config files. And basically, this is what you, what you can see. It's, it's, a, it's a file in which you define your network configuration of the interface. It's all static. This is the main point that I want to make. It's not really about the content of this file, but it's more about how, how it's handled. So you need to craft this file yourself. You need to save it on a disk. And then it's not everything. Nothing will pick this file automatically. No, nothing is going to apply those changes. You need to basically manually go and restart Network Manager or something like this. Or you just modify the file. You forget to restart the service. And then you realize only two years after when you reboot the server that it's not coming back because there is a mistake in your file and no one really checked for it. So yeah, you are basically deferring the error check for possibly indefinite, indefinite future. And this is suboptimal because also no one really checks if what you do there is correct syntax wise. You know, if you screwed up in this file, you lose network and, and goodbye. So then people invented something called NMCLI. So CLI on top of network manager, which allows you to change some configuration at runtime so we are removing this part of having a static file somewhere that you need to modify, save, go, restart, and, you know, and pray that it's correct. So you can have a CLI in which you define what you want to change. If some of those changes are incorrect, it will do some you know, error handling. So in this example, I, for what I was trying to do, I was trying to set IPv4 address 
which was exceeding above 255. So, so we can see the last part of this address here is 9924. There is no way IPv4 address can be correct like this. In the old style network manager config file, this would fly. You have file like this, then you, you restart network manager and bam, no network. With this one, at any point in time, you didn't lose network connectivity. So it's, it's something nicer than we had, but you know, in Kubernetes world, this is still not declarative way. It's, you know, it gives you some error handling, but it all happens at runtime. It's still imperative. You need to basically click what you want to change, and it doesn't scale. If you now have a flock of 1,000 servers, yeah, good, good luck with that, unless you have some, some ugly bash, bash scripting. But, you know, we cannot get everything at once. So there is also one more thing to, to, the, to the tool I just I just show you. So we have the NM state CTL then, and we are moving now into declarative configuration. So, you know, with Kubernetes, people started inventing, oh, YAML is super nice because you can actually define almost in simple English what you want to, to have. And now, if you compare this file that you see here to the very first one, network manager configuration file I've shown you, you know, this is like light years away. This is finally something that a person can read, understand, and, you know, if you need to extend that, it's much easier than the, than the NM config file. And you know, this is super simple. In here, we just define DNS server, interfaces with IP addresses, some routes, you know, nothing fancy. There is no rocket science, but the syntax is actually something that you can give to your random sysadmin or, you know, administrator, and they will understand what's what and, and how to change it. And of course, it works both ways. So this is dumped from the current configuration, but the same way you just write your configuration and apply it. So it goes both ways, and it's, um, and it's just nicer. This is, you know, now we are in 21st uh, century. Some stuff about what, it's, what it supports is, you know, if you have VLANs, bridges, bonds, and all this kind of stuff that you can configure with Network Manager, you can configure it here. So it's not like it's some stripped off only for very basic configuration. It really has in mind the advanced use cases and, and that's it. But we are still not with this in the Kubernetes world because I didn't say anything about, you know, container orchestration, even about containers till now. It's all about managing your one physical or non-physical system. And, you know, we still need something to connect it. So, so what do we do? So, okay. Fast forward to Kubernetes world, everything is a CRD. We have, you know, declarative way and, you know, we have, we have manifest for everything. So why not having manifest for node network configuration? And this is basically what, what has been invented and, and the team came up with the, um, with the next CRD, which is node network configuration policy. It's called policy because we like this name in general in, in Kubernetes world. And again, if you read through this, it's very similar to the YAML that you've seen, you've seen before. So this example just shows creating a bond interface consisting of two slaves. Nothing super fancy, but very easy syntax. And now what we are getting is that Kubernetes will be taking care of applying this configuration. And this is really the, the milestone that we wanted to have because this gives you once declarative syntax but at the same time, it gives you Kubernetes way to reconcile, to reconcile your configuration, to apply it everywhere. Now, if you have cluster consisting of 1,000 nodes, this is the magic that you need because you apply it once and you simply wait and, and see what, um, what happens. So having said this, I will do some, some demo to show how it works in real life, and then Ben will take over and he will start explaining you how it really integrates with the rest of OpenShift ecosystem and all this kind of stuff. For people who may have seen this, so till now, this is exactly what I did in FOSDEM during February. The next five minutes of the demo will be exactly what I did at FOSDEM. And afterwards is the new stuff that I didn't do at FOSDEM because at FOSDEM we don't speak about OpenShift, so yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, so basically, very short intro to my setup. So. I have a Kubernetes cluster with three masters, three workers, so yeah, nothing super fancy. It's not really scale, but I don't need scale at this moment to show you, um, to show you the features of the, of the operator. And I prepared three and a half manifests, so I'm going to show you, because I was, I was focusing a lot about, uh, you know, error handling and all this kind of stuff. So I want to show you that 
we have operator which is not only helpful with applying configuration that is correct, because this is the easiest part and this is what people never struggle with. But what happens when you try to apply configuration that is bad? So, you know, we want to have something that will check and bad not only syntax wise, because, you know, detecting that IP address is incorrect is super easy. But what, for example, if you want to apply DNS server, if you want to configure DNS server that doesn't exist, is unreachable. This is not valid configuration, but it's also not something that you can check, you know, with programming, we would say, at compile time. It's a runtime error, but, you know, we, we need to handle the, those two. So I have this manifest with, with wrong DNS here. So basically what I will try to do, I will, and, and this is the, the policy CR, which, which we've seen already before on the slide. But the main part here is that I'm configuring DNS resolver with an IP address which is not, you know, backed by anything. This is IP address I invented. There is no DNS server there. So if you try to use it, you will, you will fail. And the rest of the stuff, it does some additional, yeah, syntax sugar over, you know, I want to make sure that there is IP configuration and this kind of stuff. Because, you know, I don't want to configure IPv6 DNS server if I don't have IPv6 and this kind of stuff and not selector because I want to apply it only on, um, on one of my machines. And to show you the starting state also on this machine, so this is what we have on the right hand side, this is configuration, this is the current configuration of the, of the network manager. So yeah, let's, let us apply this manifest and see what happens. Um, and at the bottom, we can see that I'm doing watch over OC get and NCP because I want to see the state of this, of this CR. How it, how it gets applied and so on. So, so we can see that, yeah, something, something appeared here. So we see, you know, configuration progressing. Now some people may ask, okay, but you, you just put this DNS server into, into the, into Varan Network Manager Resolve Conf and you just said you are going to handle this. So yeah, so now the problem with handling network runtime errors is that you need to have some time for everything to reconcile and to detect that it's not really failing. Because if I have a DNS server which, you know, didn't reply during first second, is it, you know, is, is it fair to say that it's down and it's wrong configuration? Or maybe it's some, it's some, hiccup, some hiccup, you know. So in this case, I configure this operator to wait for, I think, like one or two minutes before it will revert this change. This is why not, nothing else happens and this is why I'm basically talking to you and you don't see anything. And I will use this time to show you the next manifest which I'm going to apply. And it will be a very simple manifest in which I will add additional IP address to my server. So, so this is, yeah, again, something that people do often, something that now needs to be customized by node because you don't want to apply the same IP address to, to all the machines that, that wouldn't fly. But I leave this part about templating and so on for some different talk because it's, you know, it's, it's more about YAML syntax then. But the second manifest that I will apply will just, you know, take the, take the interface ENP3S0, an arbitrary name, but I have this interface, and it will add additional static IP address on this, uh, on this node. So I will apply it in a moment once I have the server, the server down. And then the third manifest which I will show you it will be a policy applying the correct DNS. So you've seen, I, I previously had 9999, now I'm applying this uh, FD something which, which doesn't work. And at the end, I will apply 1111, and this is correct one, I have connectivity there, so, so then you will see that it immediately, um, immediately applies. Okay, so end of my, my, my talking about this, you see on the right hand side that it got reverted to 9999, and on the bottom you can see fail to configure. So, so this is basically the interesting part that I wanted um, to show you. And if you want to dig deeper, because you know, this error doesn't tell you much, somewhere deep in the logs, I could probably find the error message and you know, what, what really happened. Yeah, this is not something that I should be usually doing during live demo, but you know, maybe, uh, yeah. Failed checking DNS connectivity, and we can see that it was trying to go to this FD something server and good IO timer. And basically after one minute of IO timeout, we decide no, it's, it's not going to fly. So, so we, just, we just drop it. So going to the network configuration. So 
what is my starting state because I'm adding IP address, but you may say, ah, you are not applying everything because you already have this IP address. No, I don't have it. So this is this ENP3S0 and I have dot four, but I don't have dot 50. So something super simple, but, but still worth, you know, showing as a, as a feature. I am applying this, at the bottom we see. It's super fast because adding IP address, you know, it's not a rocket science. You just need to run one command on a system. And now if I do the same thing, we can see, okay, we have dot 50. So some additional detail, you see the previous one disappeared and this is because of the way how we do this declarative, uh, declarative IP addressing. So long story short, I want you to define all the IP addresses from this stack. I don't want you to mix and match and have, you know, someone adding those IP addresses and, and whatnot. The, the cool part now about, about Kubernetes is that, you know, I applied it once, but now what happens if you go manually to the server and delete this IP address? I also want to handle this because I don't want to have Kubernetes applying CR, doing it once and, you know, forget to see you in next life. I want it to continuously keep checking if the configuration that you have is really there. So what I will try to do now, and I'm freestyling, I don't have this command in the history, so I hope it will be okay. I will delete this IP address, and then I will kick, the, um, kick my pod to, you know, to, to bypass this one minute of a check and, and to see if it applies it um, immediately. So IPA delete, and I will get this IP address, or I will try. That was in the test story sequence. Uh, I hope this is what it used to be. Yep, so I don't have this address anymore here as we can see. And yeah, now we have this timeout. I don't want us to wait, so I'll just kill the pod and it will recreate and it will be like waiting for this time. So this is my pod and I'm just going to Let's give it a moment to recreate. Uh, is it already running? I hope. Mm -hmm. If not, this is live demo. <laughs> uh, do I have handler on this one? No. no, that's not yet there. Okay, let's give it 15 seconds, yeah. This is what happens when you have non-pre-recorded demos. You start doing stuff and you know, it's not always as, as fast as you would like to have, but okay. If not, then you know, then we don't have it and, and we will give it another try. But what I can do in the meantime, I can get this third manifest. I will just apply it to a different, different node because I, I basically killed the pod on this one node here. So I will go to worker three. And remember, so I will be applying 1111, and this is DNS server that I don't have there. So let's go to this node. This is, ah, that's not how we number nodes. Yeah, 0, 1, 2, I don't have 3. So this will be mine. Worker 1, 24. Okay, yeah, uh, so uh, resolve conf. Yeah, so we have some configuration, but we can see that it's not, that it definitely doesn't have one, 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 one. So I can safely apply this manifest. And we can see, yeah, here it already went to available, successfully configured. On the right hand side you can see this server appearing. So, so yeah, so we have all we needed. Let's see if the pod came back. If not, we call this demo a failure, but you know, it is what it is. Well, I don't have it. Okay, I won't be taking more time because Ben still has a lot of stuff to do. Maybe by the end of the talk we have this pod back. If not, then you have to trust me, you know. At the end, you know, we are some guys on the stage telling you stuff, so we assume that you believe us. Uh, but yeah, basically this is what I wanted to show you. So we go back to the, to the presentation and Ben will take from here. Yeah, just, just some super short stuff that I, I was supposed to tell you during waiting for those timeouts. 
The NM stage itself, it's written in Rust, even though the whole of Go is, sorry, the whole of Kubernetes ecosystem is in Go and so on. This is a bit of a different world and, you know, Rust is the new cool kid in the vlog, so, you know, so, so this is the Rust. But at, underneath, you know, it uses still Network Manager as a backend. There were some, some ideas or discussions to also use some other backends, but, you know, I don't want to touch this too much because basically today NM state is to be used with Network Manager. So, so this is, you know, this is how it is. Kubernetes operator, live, live and proven in action. So what I'm showing you, people use it, people pay for it. We have customers already for a lot of releases. So it's not, you know, brand new shiny stuff that we will release sometime in the future. And you can use NM state from Rust, Golang, Python. So basically whatever you want, you, you have it there. It's very difficult to find an environment in which you cannot use NM state. So, so this is it. And yeah, Ben takes takes it from here, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're using NM state in OpenShift and kind of why we chose to, to pursue NM state in OpenShift, and I'm hoping maybe to convince all of you that NM state is a really good thing and you should be using it uh, as much as you can. Um, so this, this slide is just a list of uh, existing OpenShift integrations. As we've just seen, the Kubernetes NM state operator was kind of the first one. Uh, the next three there are all various different installation methods for OpenShift, and every one of them has some sort of NM state integration. Unfortunately, it's all slightly different, um, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Uh, as of OpenShift 4.13, we also have NM state on the host, so you can just drop files into Etsy NM state and they'll get applied. Uh, we prefer if you use one of our more formal interfaces, but that is available if you need it. And then the machine config operator in 4.13 also added a very tiny little bit of integration with NM state uh, to deal with some rel 8 to rel 9 incompatibility issues. Uh, but that's, that's not uh, user visible and there's never going to be an MCO NM state interface. So um, I'm just mentioning it, but uh, most people will never see that. So why did we choose NM state? Well, networking is complicated. Uh, as I hope you all know, um, and networking domain-specific tools are really good. Uh, there, are, there are other ways that we have used in OpenShift that are kind of generic configuration for the host, and uh, those have a bunch of drawbacks, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. It avoids reinventing the wheel, because the RHEL team actually wrote this and supports it for the most part, and so we, we don't actually have to do a lot of the work on it. They, they kind of take care of that for us, so that's really awesome. Uh, it's also providing us kind of one central location to address conflicts with other networking config tools because there, there are other tools that are in the OpenShift ecosystem that mess with the host networking and uh, sometimes they conflict with what we're trying to do through NM state and uh, we've, we've had pretty good luck kind of addressing those conflicts on the NM state side and then you know, we don't have to worry about it quite as much um, with the other operators. And as I mentioned, it's already widely used in OpenShift. Uh, not in a super coordinated way. Everybody's kind of got their own slightly different take on, on how to use NM state, but uh, there is quite a bit of it already, and uh, we've, we've had really good luck with it. So obviously, it's not all roses. Uh, there are some drawbacks to using NM state. It can conflict with other network configuration tools. Uh, you can't really use it with MCO network configuration. Uh, there are some other network operators, and uh, sometimes we've had, we've had conflicts with those too. As I mentioned, we've, we've had pretty good luck resolving those conflicts, so they, these are not like fatal problems, but it, it's something to be aware of. Another issue is that the YAML syntax for the NM state configuration is not compatible with the OpenShift API guidelines, and that has made it a little bit more difficult to integrate cleanly with OpenShift because uh, we can't actually put NM state data right in the OpenShift API. We have to kind of just treat it as a big uh, block of YAML and pass it directly through to NM state. The API team doesn't like that. Um, it causes us some issues, and so we're, we're working to resolve that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, another limitation for right now is that it can't be used for most day two operations on the Oven Kubernetes bridge, um, just because there again, we have another networking tool, the Configure OVS script, that is trying to configure that bridge, and in, if you have NM state also trying to configure it, they, they clash and bad things happen. So what are we doing about these, these drawbacks? Uh, 
So first of all, as I mentioned, if we get all of our network configuration in NM state and we don't have all of these other network configuration tools, then the, the conflicts will just go away. Um, and, and it's also uh, been helpful for resolving those conflicts. Um, the NM state team, uh, we're also working with them trying to kind of make the NM state API more palatable to OpenShift. And so we have we've made some progress on that. We have a ways to go. Um, but we are having some productive conversations there. And uh, just very recently, we merged a new feature to allow NM State to configure the Oven Kubernetes bridge. Um, and once we get that into a shipping release and GA and everything like that, then uh, the conflict with Configure OVS will go away because it'll be all NM State from start to finish. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. So uh, just, just kind of a quick uh, this is sort of historical, um, but some people are still using machine config operator for network configuration. And uh, what they're doing in that case is basically just dropping NM connection files, which we looked at earlier, onto the host. And then uh, because of the way MCO works, it reboots and then network manager picks them up. Um, downsides of that, MCO is not network aware. Uh, it's just blindly writing these files, including invalid files. And so if you write a bad file, into your um, network manager location. MCO will reboot the node, it'll come up, and it just doesn't have uh, networking, which is obviously not ideal, because it makes it difficult to debug. Um, also, obviously, any change that's made via MCO, or almost any change, uh, requires a reboot of all the affected nodes. So like, if you're trying to update DNS for your whole cluster, your whole cluster has to be rebooted, which is kind of a pain. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, if, if, if there's a problem with your configuration, MCO is not going to catch it until after the node is rebooted and uh, things are just horribly broken. So how does NM state help with this? Well, as we sh showed you, uh, NM state validates network configuration before applying it. Um, so if you have a, a really obviously wrong configuration, you have incompatible options or um, typoed uh, a field name or anything like that, NM state will catch that right up front and uh, the configuration will never be applied. NM state and Kubernetes NM state also validate the network state after applying it, and that was Matt's demo of the DNS error. Um, so if you do have a problem with your configuration that only shows up at runtime, we'll revert it and go back to a known good state. And also, NM state never requires a reboot, so you don't have to worry about uh, changes to your networking being super disruptive unless the changes that you're making are themselves disruptive. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have another kind of major integration point besides just the operator, which is in the installer. And uh, one of the reasons that we have that is that if you're configuring networking through MCO, you need to have at least a minimal amount of networking to be able to pull ignition right up front. And uh, so, if you have something like um, mandatory VLANs or bonds that don't work in an unbonded uh, configuration, you really need to have that in place before the node even uh, can pull ignition. Um, there are also limitations because MCO doesn't do per node um, configuration. It can't do static IPs because there's no way to assign a specific IP to a specific node. And that's, that's something that NM state gives us. Um, these are super common use cases for on-prem deployments. So this was this was pretty much a mandatory thing for us to implement, and so that was that was one of the big um, driving factors for moving to NM state away from machine config operator. There are also, as I mentioned, a number of single-purpose operators out there that are kind of have a more narrow focus, and they're they're just trying to do one specific piece of configuration on a, a given uh, host or interface. Um, one thing that we've run into is that a lot of times when people have proposed single purpose operators, they're just implementing a subset of Kubernetes NM state anyway, and we'd much rather have them just use the operator that already already exists. Uh, for one thing, if, if you're implementing a whole new operator, you have to do all of this error handling and all of the special casing for uh, conflicts with other things, and that's already handled by Kubernetes NM state. So it's a bunch of uh, duplicated work that um, you don't really need to do. Also, uh, you know, as I've kind of touched on multiple times, if you have a bunch of single purpose operators all trying to do host networking, there's a lot more chance for conflict. And we, 
as I said, we, we run into that uh, on a semi-regular basis. So the more that we can kind of get everything into Kubernetes NM state, I think the better off we're going to be. All right, and that was all for the presentation. I guess we can move on to questions. Uh, so the question was whether we can use Kubernetes NM state to clean up network interfaces that are no longer used. Uh, I believe the answer is yes. Um, there are some caveats to that. If you just tell NM state to make an interface absent, it will not do what you think. Um, all it's going to do is go out and remove the profile, but any configuration that was, or if you had existing configuration under a different profile, it's not going to remove that, it's just not going to create a new profile. Um, so what, what you actually need to do in that case is uh, add the interface to your NM state configuration and just tell it to disable IPv4 and IPv6 and then it will, it will remove any configuration uh, that might have been on that interface. It does not right now. Um, oh, uh, right. Uh, so the, the question was whether Kubernetes NM state has any uh, mechanism to prevent workloads from being deployed on a node before it's had a chance to apply the network configuration. It, it doesn't really right now. Uh, our, kind of our solution at the moment is, is the installer side NM state uh, integration where those, those configurations that are provided to the installer get applied to the node before anything else is coming up, uh, even before MCO is pulling ignition, as I mentioned. So that's, that's kind of our workaround for that. Uh, that is definitely a problem we're looking to solve in the future, though, for, for more disruptive changes with uh, the operator, because it is something that, as we're making more and more use of this, uh, is becoming a bigger problem. So that's, that is a future problem for us. Yeah, but I think like very short summary to this is basically we give you a way to apply all the network configuration at install time and the operator is in case you forgot something or in case you are changing your topology fundamentally. So it's not really an urgent issue also for, for us. So it's, it's more from that, from that perspective. Because if you, if you start asking questions, can you use the operator before you really bootstrap your cluster, then you go into this chicken egg problem, which you have with other parts of what we are working on daily basis. Is how do you run an operator if this is not yet a cluster? So then your operator needs to have a way to run in semi-standalone mode, though not yet as a Kubernetes operator. Because if you are talking about you know, configuring something at install time, Mm -hmm. Right, so, so we are discussing now about adding nodes to the existing cluster. So for us, the solution is that in your machine config pool, for example, you configure this network already so that when the machines go up, they will get this config. So again, we are making day two problem a day one problem, and we have a solution for this. To solve what you want us to solve, I think the easiest, and we could implement it as an RFE, basically, is that we would be adding a taint always to a node, and then our operator would be removing the taint. And this is something that, you know, basically is very quick to implement. A lot of components already do it. For us, why we cannot do it right here, right now, is that we are not core operator yet, so we cannot add an arbitrary taint because then you don't always have our operator to remove it. But as soon as it happens, you know, remind about yourself and we can do it as basically, you know, the first feature in the new world.
I think we can get one more. If not, then not. <laughs> okay, that's it then. Thank you very much.